Hello, welcome to Chakosa TV, the table of heavenly contents. We are broadcasting from Nairobi, Kenya, and my name is Christine. You are most welcome to our worship, our Sunday service, communion service. Just worship Jesus. Let's take this time to thank Him for His goodness, and remember, He never leaves you, nor will He ever forsake you. Jesus. Thank you for your precious blood that you shed on the cross. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus we have been forgiven. All our sins are remitted, taken out of the way. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus we are justified, acquitted, made just as if we never sinned. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus we are sanctified, set apart for holiness in the most holy God. 
We thank you that the blood of Jesus cleanses us now and continually from everything that's impure. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus, we are now temples of the Holy Spirit, whom we have from God. And we are not our own, we are bought with a price. So we choose to glorify God with our spirit and our bodies, which are God's. We thank you that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel, any other blood. That the blood of Jesus speaks peace, forgiveness, acquittal, mercy. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus we can now approach the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Thank you for your precious blood. Thank you for your precious blood. Father, thank you for sending your son, the ultimate sacrifice. And today, as we remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as we proclaim his death, we receive newness of life. We receive healing for our bodies, protection from satanic attacks, a brand new future, a hope, and immortality. Blessed be your name forever. Let's sing it again. Jesus, Jesus. The benefits of the body and the blood of Jesus. That's our topic for this communion service. The benefits of the body and the blood of Jesus. Now the death of Jesus on the cross activated God's will. What's God's will? God's will is his written word. The logos. Okay. Now let me just explain something to you briefly about the will. This is a revision. I've taught this many times but let me tell you something about the word of God. The word of God is not literature so it doesn't grow old. Every time you read it, it's brand new. So it's going to sound as if you're hearing it for the very first time. If you've heard me teach about the blood and the body of Jesus in the past. So when a person dies, um, their will is read to their heirs. Okay? Especially the mandatory heirs. Okay? These are called direct descendants. So this is what happens when a person dies. They either die tested or they die intestate. When they die testate, it means they wrote a will before they died. And the will stipulates or contains how their estate or what they owned when they were still alive is to be shared out to the children of whoever is left. Okay? Whoever survives them. Okay? Now, there are certain people who die without writing a will. That's called intestate. For that reason, the government writes the will for them and appoints people to take care of their wealth, whatever they've left, and to distribute it fairly and equally amongst the beneficiaries. But Jesus Christ died having written a will, okay? So we call that a tested will, okay? Jesus died, tested, okay? Mm -hmm. He died having written a will for us. Now, let me just explain to you the legal um, aspect of death and wills, because it's all from the Bible. So when a person dies, the will that they wrote, which is usually hidden, because if you're privy to the contents of the will, you get disqualified from it. Yeah? If one were to tell the court um, that, oh, so-and-so knew the contents of the will, then it means that will was not really written by the dissident or the person who died. Somewhat you influenced the writing of that will. For that reason, the will is declared interesting. It's nullified and the new one is written by the government for you. So a will is usually hidden and it's only read when the writer, the testator, is dead. So the Old Testament was the hidden will of God. Are you getting that? Mm. When Jesus died, he reveals God's will in the New Testament. You see? 
That's why people in the Old Testament, somewhat the Spirit of God would come upon them, but he couldn't enter them. He would just come upon them. And as long as the Spirit of God was upon them, they would perform mighty miracles, signs and wonders. After that, the Spirit of God would leave and they would become normal. Then the Spirit comes again, you see. But today, he lives in us permanently. And if you want him to act, you merely need to make a decree. So when Jesus died, his will was read by the Holy Spirit to us. When was it read? When the disciples were in the upper room and they began to pray in tongues. The will of God was revealed for that time. Okay? So, let's, let me just give you an example of how it happens on earth when somebody dies. So the will is read to their mandatory heirs. And the mandatory heirs are the direct descendants. So if a man or a woman dies, the will they wrote is read to their mandatory heirs, the direct descendants, like their spouse and children. Okay? And the will is also read, it can also be read to collateral heirs. Collateral heirs are descendants coming from indirect lineage, but whose names are mentioned in the will. Okay? For example, a man who dies, who has brothers and sisters, the brothers and sisters are collateral heirs. They could actually be bequeathed something if that's mentioned in the will. So this will is read for people to hear. After reading of the will, the process of proving the will starts, proving that this is really it. And that's what we call probate, the process of proving the will. Okay? So here the beneficiaries are identified as true and inclusive, and then the executors are identified too. They are appointed or confirmed as the right ones. Yeah? So who is an executor? The executor is the one that handles the financial aspect of the will. In fiduciary, fiduciary is really in trust. Okay? A fiduciary accountant is somebody who handles money in trust on behalf of other people. In some nations of the world, if you break, if you breach fiduciary trust, you're jailed immediately or you're fined heftily. So the beneficiaries are identified. These are either direct descendants or indirect descendants. But as long as they're mentioned in the will and something is bequeathed to them, they must be identified and proved to be true. That's what probate is. Okay? You get that? Um, and then the one who executes the contents of the will is also identified. And usually those ones are written in the will itself. Yeah? And then um, after that, uh, what is uh, what we call the bequest? What has been bequeathed? The estate, whatever the dissident or the deceased, the one who's died, whatever they left is then um, shared. Okay? It is distributed to the beneficiaries according to the will, okay? Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, all this happens as the court is approached by the one appointed to execute the will to issue grant of probate or permission to execute or realize the will. So grant or probate is given to you in court to help you realize the will, as in liquidate the bequest, turn it into money, and then share it. Okay? Now, a confirmation of probate, which is legal authority to distribute the realized estate, is then granted and the estate, what the dissident or the deceased left, is officially transferred to the beneficiaries. So it's an elaborate process. So number one, the will is read, the beneficiaries are identified, and the executors of the will. That's called probate, the process of proving the will. And then, of course, you go to court, and then you go with a death certificate, you go with the will, and then you lodge it in court, in a probate court, so that the succession process begins, where the beneficiary succeed the one who's died. Okay? I'm laying the foundation so that when I start talking about the will of God, it will become easier for you. Okay? Now, uh, after consolidating everything this person owned, whether there are pieces of land, whether it's money, jewelry, cars, houses, or whatever, you go back to court and you say, okay, these are the things that the gentleman or the woman owned, and we've identified them all, and this is the value. Then the court now does something called confirmation of probate. The court says, okay, now permission is granted for you to distribute all these things according to the will. Okay? And now that's the whole idea of succession is over. 
everybody goes their way happy. If they want to work together as a family, well and good. If they want to do their separate things, well and good. It's important for all of you to understand this because at some point or the other, you'll be an heir of somebody, okay? Or somebody will inherit from you. So it's important for you not only to understand the spiritual aspect of uh, succession, but also understand the legal aspect of it. Because sometimes family members are denied of what their fathers or mothers or uncles or aunties or relatives or even friends bequeath to them because of their ignorance, okay? So it's important for you to know this thing. So I want you to understand that a will cannot be enforced until the testator, the one writing it, is dead. Okay? So this should explain to you why Jesus had to die. Alright? So their death brings life to the will. So Jesus' death on the cross brought life to the will of God for our life. So God's will for us is what we call eternal life. Now in Hebrews 9 verse 16 to 17, I'm going to move fast because I have a lot of scriptures to share with you. The Bible says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So where there is a will, the will can only, be in act, uh, can only be activated when the one who writes it is dead. As long as Jesus was still walking on the face of the earth, the will of the Father was not properly and fully known. Okay? That's why he talked in parables. Jesus spoke words that were under the law, under the will. Okay? They were hidden. That's why the Bible says to the Jews, even today, when the gospel is read, there's a veil on their eyes. They are not able to see. But the Bible says when they turn to Jesus and identify with his death, the veil is removed. Because the will now is apparent. It's out for everybody to see. So Hebrews 9, 17 says, For a testament is of force after men are dead. A will is only of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator lives. So as long as Jesus hadn't died, there was no power. The devil had complete authority over everybody. So they had to consistently slaughter animals to keep the devil at bay because the will of God was not revealed, okay? The word of God was of no power as long as Jesus was still alive. As soon as he died, he activated the will and the will was read by the Holy Spirit for us, which is the reason why the Bible says in 1 John 2, 27, that the anointing that's within you teaches you all things. That anointing is of the Holy Spirit and he reveals to you all things. Now you can read the Bible by yourself and understand it by yourself. Okay? Because the will has been revealed. Things are easier now than they were before. Okay? But it's going to get sweeter. Just stay with me. So, when you take Holy Communion, you announce that Jesus died. And now you can enjoy everything he bequeaths to you. But this is the significance of taking Holy Communion. In fact, as I talk, could you prepare your juice um, and bread or wine and bread, whatever you like to take, yeah? Prepare it and put it there. A little pinch of bread and, and just a little uh, a double of uh, juice or something. Yeah? A tot or a double tot of wine or juice or whatever. Even water will do. Because I want us to take Holy Communion together. There's power in agreement. So when you take Holy Communion, you are reading the will all over again. Are you getting that? Mm -hmm. And within the will, you'll find out that there was money bequeathed to you. There is eternal life bequeathed to you. There is peace bequeathed to you. There is marriage bequeathed to you. There is longevity bequeathed to you. There is healing bequeathed to you. There is deliverance bequeathed to you. Everything you ever needed is bequeathed to you. But you have to activate it by taking Holy Communion. Okay? So don't take Holy Communion lightly. Holy Communion is not a sign or proof that you belong to a church. Because some people take it as a sign of membership. I'm a member of this church, so I take Holy Communion in the church. Holy Communion is the activation of all the great things Jesus bequeathed to you. The things you inherit from God himself. So a person who partic participates, yeah, a person who takes part in Holy Communion cannot be broke. You may not have money only for a short time, but you can't be broke. You shouldn't die. You shouldn't fall sick. And if sickness comes, you kick it out. Because that's not what was bequeathed to you by Jesus. You're, you're given divine help by Jesus. You understand? You see, you can be given land, bequeathed to you by your father or your mother or some relative or friend. And then somebody chooses to snatch it away from you. You have authority as the bona fide owner of the land to fight for it until it's restored back to you. 
So when the devil brings sickness or disease or some delay in your life, you have authority to fight it off. So that the real thing Jesus bequeathed to you is restored back to you. Understand the things of God. Otherwise, the Christian faith will just be another drudgery, some hardship, some difficult, one other task for you to do, waking up to pray and to read, and you're not seeing results because you don't understand the deeper things of God. All right? So when Jesus died, the probate was granted, confirmed, and the estate of our father became ours by birth. It's not yours by good behavior. Here's why most Christians miss the blessings of God. When a will is read, it is read to the mandatory heirs, as in the one writing the will cannot leave you out. If you are a father and you have children, even if you hate one, according to law, you still must bequeath to them equal portion. You must. Okay? So the will of God is not for the good ones only. The will of God is not for the perfect ones. The will of God is for any person who is saved. Who becomes a child of God. If you are a child of God. And you've been doing crazy things out there. And you remember. Wait a minute. I'm a child of God. Instantly all the blessings of heaven are yours. Including eternal life. So for one to go to hell. They've really worked hard to go there. For you to go to hell. You've worked hard. You've frustrated angels. The Holy Spirit. You've frustrated the will of God. You've frustrated the grace of God, you frustrated everything that God bequeaths for you. You decided, I don't want any good thing in this life. That's how people end up in hell. Yeah. Look, everything written in the Bible is for God's children. All the blessings of God are for God's children. Now, a will is not beneficial to the well-behaved. My beautiful daughter here is a lawyer. And she will bear me witness that if I go to court and I find out that because somebody didn't like me, they left me out of a will, I can challenge that will, in fact, even nullify it. Isn't that true? Yes. So whether a father liked you or not, whether you are in agreement with the father or not, when they die, you must be given their estate, a portion of it, okay? It has to be divided equally, whether you're male or female. There was a time when they never used to be quiz to women because they say women are going to another family, so they should not be given bequest, yeah? In some communities, because a woman was leaving, um, in some communities, a woman was given the bride price as the, as the bequest, okay? In some communities, that's, that's what happens. A woman is given the bride price because she's not inheriting from the father. So she's inheriting as she goes to another family. But that's, uh, that's just communities. In the kingdom of God, if you are a child of God, and how does one know they are a child of God? The Bible says those who believed in him, those who received him, he gave them power to be called children of God. The Bible does not say those who are perfect, those who are excellent, those who do things right. Only those who believe. So do you believe? Amen. You are a child of God. Now that you're a child of God, all the blessings of God are yours by birthright, not by behavior. Okay? Because you're born of the Holy Spirit, born of the Word of God, everything God intends to give to the children he loves because the Son, our Father, died, activated the will according to Hebrews chapter 9. And now the will of God is open. It's been read for you. That God wants you rich, prosperous, successful, happily married or blessed in a family. If you want to be married, of course. If you don't want to be married, you can still be happy as a single person, okay? There's no rule about some of these things. But God wants you rich and prosperous. Your business must succeed because you're a child of God. Your business does not succeed because you're well behaved. Of course, if you read Romans chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible says it's, the, it's God's goodness that leads you to change of mind. So if you are a bad person and you realize that it doesn't stop God from blessing you, do you know what will happen to you? You'll start becoming good. Okay? Do you know why people are bad? They're usually bad because they're rebelling against bad leadership. That's what makes people bad. A rebellion against bad leadership. But when you finally discover that the leadership is good, you start being good too. Okay? 
bad behavior, anything contrary to good is always a sign that someone is rebelling against an authority they've misunderstood or an authority that has subjugated them. Yeah. People rebel against bad leadership. If your father is too harsh, you tend to want to rebel against them. If your government is mistreating your people, people want to strike. They want to rebel. But when you're treated well, you start developing good qualities too. So this is how God gets your heart changed. By bequeathing to you good things anyway. Okay? And when he does, he says his giftings and callings are without repentance. He won't take them away from you, even if you run away from him. Do you remember the prodigal son? He got his bequest. That one got, the, the, he got his inheritance even before the father died. So, but he went and, and uh, abused it. He completely messed it all up. Yeah. He, what is the word? What is the, the word used when somebody abuses money and wealth and all that? Thank you, squandering. He's squandered it. Yeah? But the guy returned back home and the father gave him another heritage. You know, in fact, this second time around, the father gave him everything. Do you see his bad behavior didn't change a thing? Now, some preacher is not cringing on their chair because you've surrounded yourself with people who are so guilty. Your church is growing on guilt. And I'm liberating them and you're thinking I'm giving wrong doctrine. I can see you, mister. Yeah? Your ministry is based on fear. Fear of hell. Fear of disappointing God. Fear of your grace being removed from them if they don't tell the lie. Yeah? You're an idiot. You're misleading the body of Christ. God will bless even the worst of all offenders. Did Jesus visit Zacchaeus? The guy who's stealing from everybody. Jesus went to his house and the Pharisees said, how, how could he go to the house of a guy who we know is a thug? You see, the, the idea here is this. Believe in Jesus. After you believe in him, you become a child of God. Then he bequeaths to you whatever you want. He gives it to you for free. After that, you realize how good he is, according to Romans 2 verse 4. Then you repent. You change your mind and you start following his ways. That's how it works. But if you try to be good, to be blessed, forget it. You're blessed first, then you see. It's the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God that makes you repent. It's the goodness of God, not your goodness. It's the goodness of God that makes you repent. Understand this 1126. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You do what? There you go. All right, apologies. We, we, we had a, a little bit of internet issues there. Okay, we were just discussing what to do. Sometimes internet fluctuates, so I think we are good, yeah? Yeah. All right. So where do you want me to take it from? Yeah. Uh, how, how, how long did it, uh, did it lapse? A few minutes? Oh, okay, okay. That wasn't too long. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 11.26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. The word show there is katagelo in Greek. This is 1 Corinthians 11, 26. And it means to promulgate the will, to read it out aloud. Okay? So what are you supposed to be confessing? You're supposed to be confessing life. You're supposed to be confessing prosperity, peace, joy, and all the good things you need here on earth. And you're also supposed to be confessing eternal life. Okay, And the Bible says when you eat the bread and drink the wine, you are, in that act, as you eat the bread and drink the wine, you are announcing to the angels, you are announcing to demons, you are announcing even to the Father himself, that he already bequeathed you of good things. And these things need to start manifesting in your life. That's why it's important for you to take Holy Communion. The Bible says as often as you eat it, Anyone can take Holy Communion. You don't need to, to be dressed in a cassock with a mitre and a crook. You don't need to be dressed like a priest to take Holy Communion. Because you're already a child of God. You believed in Him. Okay? Are you getting that? So I want you to take your bread and your wine so that we can 
promulgate. We, we can announce that Jesus died. The will is activated and the will must manifest in my life right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Wow. One of the best ways of defeating demons, those are the crooked spirits that come to eat off your heritage, is when you take Holy Communion. One of the best ways to defeat death is taking Holy Communion. One of the best ways to defeat sickness and disease, being broke, poverty, lack, insufficiency, all the crazy things that affect you, fear, anxiety, worries, depression, take Holy Communion. It's a major speech in the spiritual realm. Okay? Mm -hmm. When you take Holy Communion, you have spoken statements that no demon can discount or counter. Right? Mm -hmm. Because God is a judge. And if you read this thing before him, he makes a declaration. When you take Holy Communion, you're reading what's yours. And you say, Father, why is it that man is not coming my way? Yet I'm your child. I'm part of the heritage. You bequeath to me a lot of money. You bequeath to me life. Why is it that I'm feeling sick? Immediately he'll dispatch angels. The Bible says he'll give his angels charge over you. To keep you in all your ways. The angels will be dispatched to come and give you what is yours. Alright? We are not ordinary people. We are the God kind. Things happen for, not against us. Alright? We are royalty. We have a budget, a heavenly budget. So when you start to do business on, business on the face of the earth, come on, money will come. If you have had financial difficulties lately, it's okay. Sometimes it's a sign that big things are coming. Yeah? And when it rains, it pours. The Bible says when the clouds are full of rain, they pour. Ecclesiastes 11. They pour. So you've been praying and your clouds are now laden, moist laden. Okay, they are heavy with moisture. They are about to precipitate. And your blessing is about to come. Amen. Amen. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you have your bread? Do you have your wine? Yeah? Let's sing. Let's sing first. Then we take the bread and the wine. Okay? Remember, by our salvation, God's will or testament is proved. And the Holy Spirit, who is the executor of the will of God, together with us, declares that we are the genuine heirs, and therefore we must enjoy the heritage. Okay? Romans 8 verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So you already have been declared, according to Romans 8, 17, you've already been declared as an heir. And you're also a joint heir with Christ. So if Jesus owns everything, you own everything. You own the cosmos. And you need to have that mindset as we have Holy Communion. Yeah? Colossians 1, 17 says, And he's before all things, and by him all things consist. Yeah? Everything belongs to him, okay? And Hebrews 1 verse 3 says he's the reflection of God's glory, that's Jesus, and the exact likeness of his being. And he holds everything together by the power of his word. And after he had provided a cleansing from sins, he sat down at the right hand of the highest majesty. Jesus cleansed all sin, then sat down. So don't think that the wrong thing that you've done or some mistake that you've made is going to stop you from being blessed. Because Jesus sat down. He dealt with sin once and for all and read the will. He says, now my children need to live life. Amen. Glory to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 to 25. It says, so I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. How that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And he gave thanks for it. So, Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you. We thank you. And the Bible says, having given thanks, he broke it. He broke the bread. Having broken it, what does the Bible say? Yeah. He said, this is my body that is for you. Not a sign of my body. This is my body. The 
that is for you. Keep doing this in memory of me. Amen. And the Bible says, He did the same with the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink from it, keep doing this in memory of me. And the Bible says when you do it, you do it in katagelo, promulgating, reading out the will. So as we take Holy Communion at this particular time, you are getting healed in Jesus' name. You are prospering in Jesus' name. You are getting married in Jesus' name. If that's what you want. There is peace in your family in Jesus' name. There's reconciliation in Jesus' name. You have eternal life in Jesus' name. You have peace of mind in Jesus' name. Everything you do is prospering in the mighty name of Jesus. I release you from bondage. You are free from demonic authority in the mighty name of Jesus. Because these are the things God has bequeathed to you. Eternal life. Happiness. Joy. Peace. I want you to take the bread. Which is now the body of Jesus. Have you taken it in your hand? Hallelujah. And because I prayed for you and I feel the anointing of the Spirit of God mightily here. I want you to take the body of Jesus right now. And as you take it, your history is changing. Transactions are changing in the heavens. Let's take the body of Jesus together. Amen. I want you to take the blood of Jesus as well. From now, there's no sickness in your body. You can't be broke when you participate in this. You can't lose. If you have court cases, you're winning them all in Jesus' name. The Bible says even the lawful captive shall be delivered. Even where you made a mistake, you'll still be blessed. The Bible says you've received double for your sins. Where well, people get rewarded for going wrong. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> there is no other God like our God. There's no other Savior like our Savior. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let's take the blood of Jesus together. Oh, let's just bless his name. He's wonderful. Oh, praise your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Blessing and honor, power and praise. Let's sing together.
Jesus, I worship you. of God blowing here. Hallelujah. Receive your blessing in Jesus' name. Ephesians 5 30 says, For we are part of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. When you take Holy Communion, we are taking of each other's body and of each other's blood. The Bible says in Romans 12, verse 5, it says, So we being many are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. You see that? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 says, First the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Now you need to understand the reason why it's important to forgive people. Because you are members of each other. And I mentioned to you earlier that children of God will not always be perfect. There are some children of God that will hurt you. You need to forgive them. Because if you take Holy Communion without forgiveness, then the will works against you. The Bible says you start eating damnation and some of you will start becoming sick and others will die. What kills people is usually the fact that we relate negatively to each other. You need to forgive people. Don't be negative. Don't be critical. When you criticize the body of Christ, you are messing with the body and the blood of Jesus. You see, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, 17 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So not only do we promulgate the will of God, but we also eat of each other. It brings us close together in love. Okay? When you take Holy Communion, you're eating of each other's flesh and drinking of each other's blood. The Bible says it here. It's not just the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus you take. You're eating of each other. First Corinthians 10, 16, 17 says it. So if you hate your fellow believer or you're bitter against them and you take Holy Communion, you're taking it unworthily. Okay? So forgive. Taking communion unworthily is really taking it in bitterness. Bitterness against somebody. Of course people will hurt you. But you know something? Even that person that has hurt you, God has bequeathed to them something. That's why your enemies continue to prosper. They never fail. Have you noticed that? Yeah, much your disappointment. That you think because somebody hurt you, they should go out there and fail. No, they won't fail. They are God's children too. You should forgive them. Okay? Just forgive them. In fact, sometimes those people that have hurt you succeed much faster. Because they are risk, they are risk takers. Yeah? They go hurting people all over the place. And in the process, they get into business deals that they make lots of money and continue hurting people. So, you know, time goes on. And you're here with your perfection broke like, you know, you've got no more money than a snake has hips. Yeah? 
Your account is lean because of bitterness and forgiveness. Forgive people. All right. First Corinthians 11, 27 to 30. Do you notice we always just speak the word of God? The Bible says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, instead of him dying to reveal his will to bless you, now you'll be accused of having killed him. Are you giving that? <laughs> because we are members of each other. So we need to love each other. Okay? The Bible says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Yeah? For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Most of the sicknesses and diseases you go through are because you're bitter. You've not forgiven people. Yes, somebody stole your money. All your investment went down the drain. Forgive them anyway. You can make more money. All right? Somebody snatched your girlfriend and went with them. Forgive them. Oh, man of God, it's hard. Did I ask you to do it in your own strength? By the power of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Do you know why people are so angry and bitter out there in the world? They try things in their own strength. They try marriage in their own strength. They try to do business in their own strength. You'll be frustrated. Use the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it's not by might. It's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So if you want to achieve anything, you've got to say, Holy Spirit, help me now. You're my helper. You're my comforter. You're my strength. You're my wisdom. Holy Spirit, help me. I need to forgive this person. According to your word, your word is true. Because I also haven't always done what's right. I've always needed forgiveness as much. You have extended forgiveness to me, O oh Father. But I have not been able to extend the same forgiveness to other people. Now I receive grace and strength from you to forgive people the same way you've forgiven me. You see? Mm. Glory to God. Mm. So when you fail to diacrino, to judge, to make distinction and preference towards God's children, if you fail to diacrino the body of Christ, to make distinction, and you go hating some and loving others, and you take Holy Communion, you will be accused. You become guilty. Yeah? Not of a felony. You become guilty of murder. Okay? So the death of Jesus Christ stops being a blessing to you. You become one who killed Jesus. Because you're busy killing the body. The Bible says, if you hate a brother without a cause, you're a murderer. Do you see that? And if you murder people with your hatred, you are killing Jesus all over again. So forgive people. All right? As you take Holy Communion, just say, I forgive my uncle, my auntie, my nephew, my niece. I forgive my cousins. I forgive my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. I forgive those people who have hurt me. I forgive them. I release them in Jesus' name. Those who've slandered me, those who've gossiped me, those who've hurt my feelings, I forgive them. Those who've abandoned me, rejected me, I forgive them in the mighty name of Jesus. Those who've stolen from me, I forgive them. Those who took me for granted, I forgive them. And I bless them in Jesus' name. Let them prosper. I don't want them to suffer. Okay. Let them prosper in Jesus' name. Let them live a happy life. Yes. That's God's nature. So when you take Holy Communion with such a heart, sickness will be removed from your heart, from your life, yeah? and you live a life that is immortal. God wants you to live forever. He doesn't want you to die. You see, in John 6, verse 50 to 51, the Bible says, This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If a man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, eternal life, not dying. And the bread that I'll give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now he's given it to us. Now, the body and blood of Jesus is life. John 6, 53 to 55. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you, sh you have no life in you. When you eat the body of Jesus and drink his blood, you have life in you. Okay? He says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That means even if you die, the fact that you took Holy Communion, God will still raise you up. Do you say that? Mm -hmm. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drinking meat. He say, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drinking meat. Okay? Mm -hmm. You get that? Mm -hmm. John 6, 56. The 58, the Bible says, 
He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. Do you believe that? It means you can start your business now and succeed. There is life in you. You're not going anywhere. Because you're a partaker of the body and the blood of Jesus. Some may ask, are children allowed to take Holy Communion? Yes, even your cat. Read the Bible. The Bible says when the Israelites went through the, the, um, the wilderness, they drank of what? Of the rock, and that rock was Jesus. Okay? They ate of the manna, and that manna was Jesus. Were the animals denied of the water? They went through the Red Sea, and the Bible calls that baptism. Those guys were baptized even with their livestock. Huh? There's no time when God said, children can't eat manna. Children can't drink from the rock. Uh, read your Bible. And the Bible says that rock was Jesus. The rock that followed them was Jesus. So as they ate manna and drank from the rock, when Moses hit the rock and water gushed out, that water was the blood of Jesus. So children can take Holy Communion. How about a person who is not saved? Can a person who is not saved take Holy Communion? A thousand times yes. Because there was a mixed multitude. I wish I had time I'd give you the scriptures for this. There was a mixed multitude amongst the Israelites. Even Janus and Jambres, the magicians that tried to withstand Moses in the presence of Pharaoh, crossed over with the Israelites. They all took Holy Communion. They were all baptized. Okay? So you don't stop anybody that's interested in the things of God. Because that could be the opportunity to connect with Jesus and ultimately get saved. After all, what is taking Holy Communion? Isn't it eternal life? Isn't it? What is salvation? Isn't it eternal life? So one way of getting saved is by taking Holy Communion. All right. Your, your priest has complicated everything. That's why your life is complicated. Even your, your Facebook status right now, the part written relationship, you've written complicated. Yeah? Your life is complicated because you're being taught the Old Testament, the unrevealed word. The, the Old Testament revealed is what we call the New Testament. Because Jesus died and the will has been activated. Okay? Now, if you're not saved, now that you've taken Holy Communion, why not just confess it? Say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and rose again for my justification. Today I receive you as Lord and Savior. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I'm now saved. Glory to Jesus. We're going to continue worshiping Jesus with the, the songs that talk about the blood. You need to get used to singing songs about the blood of Jesus, okay? A lot of Christians sing songs of unbelief. Songs that talk about their problems. Oh Lord, where are you? Where are you? Sometimes you seem so far away. Oh Lord, where are you? Where are you? Those songs won't help you. Sing scripture, the revealed will of God. Sing what benefits you. Okay? You know, we don't nurse our problems. We fix them. We solve them. So I'm not going to start singing about, oh... You've broken my heart. You've broken my heart. No, I'll fix that heart. Amen. Okay? All right? Glory to Jesus. Let's worship Jesus. Isn't it so wonderful? <laughs> Thank you. 
blessings indeed. Make sure you take Holy Communion on a daily basis. Or at least every time before you pray. Okay? The Bible says as often as you do it. So as often as you can. Once in a week it's okay. But daily is much better. We love you so very much. Thank you for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.